Friday at 7 p.m. here at the Brunswick campus. We're gonna have worship, times of just connection out in the lobby after service, games, all the things. So come, just hang out with us. It's gonna be a blast. But awesome, here comes Jay for offering. Yeah. I was, like, was that for me or for the offering? I'm kidding. Awesome. Well, hey, why don't you get your, um, your wallet or your, your phone out? And I know that we do this every week and you were just standing, but I would like to ask again, just stand on up. Let's just believe God for um, what he's going to release in your finances. Um, I was sitting there th- on the front row thinking, what would I say about the offering today? And I just, th- just want to share with you that I think there's no greater investment than putting your seed into God's soil. Um, the, some of you are wondering about me and Ashley's house. I know we've mentioned it a couple times, but we sold it recently. It's done. The deed is over. And um, it, is, it is outrageous what God has done through that. And so we just believe that that's not like a, an exception, but it's the norm for people who believe in what God can do in their life and believe that he will do what he says he will do. So when we give today, let's give with faith, not just cheerful, but faith that God is going to release financial breakthrough. Specifically, is there anyone who needs financial breakthrough today? I know that's probably everyone, but if that's you, I want you to hold your seed really high for me. If you're making out a check, make it out to Bethel Cleveland. You can text to secure give. You drop those checks off in the boxes on your way out the doors, but let's believe. God, right now, I pray over every single person in this room right now and those with their hands up for a financial miracle. God, I thank you that you are the God of more than enough. You are Shira, and you are enough, God. And I just pray that this, this morning, before they would even leave, that there would be some sort of financial breakthrough, some kind of word of encouragement, even like a text from their bank account that things are turning around. God, I pray for, for like a, a kind of release that is like the, um, those beggars who were outside of the city of Jerusalem and there was a turnaround and, and the spoils of the enemy went to them. And in one day they went from beggars to millionaires. God, I pray that that would be testimonies released in the house in Jesus mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, this is what's happening this week at Bethel Cleveland. So glad you're here today. Here are some things coming up. Are you ready to break free from the things that hold you back from your God-given destiny? Then take the next step and join us at a Freedom Weekend at the Middleburg Heights campus, September 17th through the 18th. Join us for three sessions of teaching, freedom ministry, blessing, and worship. In this safe, loving environment, you will be able to find the freedom that you need to walk in victory and live the life that you were created to live. Go online to BethelCleveland.com slash events for more. Gather groups are launching the week of September 12th. We have so many gather groups that meet on a regular basis, focusing on intentional connection in a smaller setting. If you are not yet involved in a gather group, go to BethelCleveland.com and check out the Get Involved page for more information. On Sunday, September 19th, we are going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary as a church. We will have one combined service at our Brunswick campus. If you normally attend Middleburg or Akron, we are so excited to welcome you to Brunswick at 10 a.m. to worship with our entire Bethel Cleveland family. Following the service, we will be having our final summer picnic of the season, the Shindig. We will have a pig roast, games, activities, and more as we build community and celebrate 25 years of Bethel Cleveland. We cannot wait to see you there. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? You work too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it! I'm not going to live like this anymore! so excited to host Financial Peace University here at Bethel Cleveland. I'm Stacey Vandegraaff and I can't wait for you to join Brendan McCurchy, Josh Vandegraaff and myself as we lead you through this amazing time of discussion, activations and financial freedom starting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. at the Brunswick campus. For more information, go online to BethelCleveland.com. You were born with purpose called to pursuit, created for curiosity, 
destined for adventure. God has chosen you. Will you take that step? Will you say yes? We believe that God is calling you to bring heaven to earth and carry Jesus into all the world. Heal the sick, raise the dead, impact the world. We are building a community of revivalists who will encounter God, know their identity, and live the gospel. to pray for all the uh, families of the fallen soldiers this past week, uh, 13 Americans and 169 Afghans were killed and uh, with the bombing uh, in Kabul. So let's just take a moment uh, of silence and just personally just pray for those families. All those young men, young men, one woman, uh, we're all in their 20s except one. One was in his 30s. They were like 20, 21, 22. I read through the list, saw everyone describe one of those young soldiers had a baby, has a baby due in three weeks, his first child. And another one of those soldiers has a sister that's special needs, about nine years old, who worships the ground he walks on and so excited for his life, and yet this is hitting those families right now. So it really personalizes where they are, these Marines and the one Navy man that was uh, killed. And let's, let's stand just for a minute. We'll take a moment and just wait in kind of quiet, pray together, and I'll conclude it at the end of the minute. Go ahead. Lord, we thank you for these young soldiers that, well, they sign up to protect this country. They sign up, Lord, because they're patriots and they want to see this country do well. And Lord, many of their families are suffering right now. We just pray, Lord, your hand to be upon them right now in the name of Jesus. Minister across America to all those moms and dads, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, sons and daughters. Just pray, Lord, there be a sense of of understanding and peace in this moment. And may the peace that passes understanding come upon their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for those Afghans, the hundreds of Afghans that were affected by this, the thousands and families, Lord. And Lord, all the distress over there, Lord, we've been praying all week, but we pray, Lord, for the, for the mighty warrior of heaven to come and confound the enemy, the Taliban, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, they would not be able to find the secret colonies of believers that are out there, Lord God, that you would protect them and that the believers, as we've heard reports all week, are surging across Afghanistan under persecution. We bless them right now, Lord. You'd protect them. You'd keep them safe. You'd bring them out. And Lord, build a mighty church out of Afghanistan, we say, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was getting texts during our worship service from a friend of ours here in Ohio, pastor friend. I won't mention his name for security purposes, but he's been over there for the past three weeks on the border, bringing people out of Afghanistan. And his reports are that the church is blowing up over there, man. People are coming to Jesus Christ left and right. The church there is standing true. They will not... They, 
the Taliban requires you to deny Jesus Christ. I mean, this always sounds like some kind of a urban legend that doesn't happen, you know, but deny Jesus Christ and return to Allah. And they're refusing to do that. So we know what's going on. Uh, they're just getting on a plane now, this friend of mine and his wife coming back to the U.S. They're probably going to go back in about three weeks. They've instructed their church on the ground to do what they need to do. And so amazing things are going on. That's just one little sliver of what we know about. Of course, Glenn Beck, Kenneth Copeland, many others are involved in bringing people out, Franklin Graham, out of uh, Afghanistan, getting them settled into places where they can experience freedom of worship. We thank the Lord for that. Please keep praying for them. This is a, this is a linchpin right now. This is a moment where it's kind of a 9-11 moment. I know it's just, we're just a couple weeks away from remembering 9-11 21 years ago, 20 years ago, but this is a moment right now, and, and at the same time, the fires are raging in California, and a Cat 4 hurricane, Ida, right? Ida is coming up on the same day that Katrina hit 16 years ago. I mean, there is, there is some huge parable in this whole thing. It's above my prophetic pay grade to figure it out. But it's enough for me to be alerted and go, Jesus, something's going on in America right now. Something's going on. And we believers just kind of say, oh, it'll work out. I was reading this week about the Roman Empire. And I've been reading a lot in the past few years on the Roman Empire. It fascinates me. How could a, an empire that was four, time, four times the age of the United States, arguably one of the most powerful civilizations in world history, definitely in Western history, but possibly in world history, and yet in a day become invaded by tens of thousands so-called barbarians, they only called them that because the German language to the Romans sound like bar, 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 so they called them barbarians. And the barbarians came from the north over the iced over Rhine River, but they say it took two decades for them to realize that their civilization was threatened. Two decades. You say, well, it's because they didn't have the internet. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's because they made friends with their enemies and thought, hey, this isn't so bad, but not realizing that it was totally destroying what they had had previously. And so uh, finally there was a reaction, but the reaction was too late. And it took about 200 years for the empire finally to fade away. There's still evidences of it today, obviously, in our very culture when you have Roman Greco type architecture and everything else. It's a reflection of that thousand years that we're renaissancing right now over the past 500 years specifically. So something is on the move. This is a, it's a flashpoint, it's an inflection point. I don't know how else to say that this is an important moment I've been telling my kids, I mean, they're, they get this, they understand, but I said, they, pay attention right now. This is, this is a key moment that could affect the rest of our lives. And we need to enter into prayer like never before. I've been praying more now in the mornings for America than I ever have, I think. I usually bring my requests up, spend time worshiping the Lord, you know. But boy, America's just been coming in my mind over and over. Pray for America, pray for America. So do that right now. I feel that if we push in and pray, particularly over these next three to four months till the end of the year, we're going we're gonna to see a shift in America. And I believe it's already beginning to happen because millions of Americans right now are praying. Thank God we have intercessors in America. When I come on Sunday morning and see, you know, 10 or so up front here praying together in a circle, it encourages me because I know that they're the first ones to go out in prayer and they're clearing the way you know, the way of the Lord. They're bringing high places low and low places high, evening out the path for the Holy Spirit, the land and power in this culture right now because we believe the greatest revival known to man is right in front of us, the so-called billion soul harvest. I don't even want to limit it with numbers. Maybe it's a two billion soul harvest, but we believe a massive wave of the Holy Spirit's coming and we want to be positioned for that. That's why over the past couple, well, the past five weeks, I've been focusing on this series that should be up here right now, yes, Nomads to Builders. God's collecting people together into the ecclesia. And I know there's a lot of stuff about ecclesia out there. Everyone has their own interpretation. I've got mine. I feel I'm trending according to the Word of God, but, you know, everyone feels that. 
but I do study closely what the Bible says, the New Testament says, about the church, about those ecclesia. Yes, they are the called out ones. That's what it means. But as someone reminded me this week, is that it is an institution of thought. It's an ideology that was in Jesus' mind when he said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That was not just a little gathering of people outside in a park somewhere. It's a group of people that are focused on what's going on in their world, in their culture. They're, they're, they've got their eyes upon heaven. They're, they're really following the two commandments, loving the Lord God with all their heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and loving their neighbor enough to begin to give their lives to them. Laying out, laid down lovers, as Heidi Baker called them, laying their lives down for their brothers and sisters and learning to realize it's not just about me. We no longer can be nomads. I know there's periods of time in our life where we get nomadic. And, and I, I, just, I know that happens. I think it's a rhythm of life. It's kind of a Sabbath of sorts. And you do that, and it's, it's fine, it's okay. But I'm telling you right now in this moment in history, this is not a good time to be a nomad. <laughs> I've, I know enough about sheep, which is very little, but I know enough about sheep that the wolves that come in always go for the weak or the separated. Those that wander off, they become victims to the wolf. So what do we do? We come together. We huddle up. We come like a tribe. I love in Israel, and I probably mentioned this last Sunday because it's been on my mind, but I love the tribes in Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, because even though they had their problems, my goodness, they had their problems, even fighting with one another at some times. It doesn't sound like my family, but I know it sounds like other families. You know, we always fight. There's always this, you know, because you can do that as a family. But the two key things in their life, the reasons for their existence was for two reasons. Number one, to party, to get together and have festivals, conferences, whatever you want to call it nowadays, Sunday services, let's get together, celebrate together. It's what these tribes are about. We're all out there, but we gather together, gather, scatter, gather, scatter, gather, scatter. It's the rhythm of the church. We gather together. We do that for celebration, but we also do it like the ancient tribes of Israel. We come together for war. When there's something that is out there that is attacking the very name of Jesus Christ, when the poor are being offended, when people are being abused, when justice is not in our circles, the church needs to come together. This is the ecclesia. They come together and in God's mind they are attended. As I read in Ephesians 3, 2 and 3 last week, that the, the intention of God for the church, one of the intentions is that they might display, that's what the Greek word is, display the manifold wisdom of God. I mean, this is, this is wisdom above our pay grade. This is wisdom outside of our solar system. It is outside of our universe. It's in the kingdom of God that stuff will come upon the gathered church that they will get together that will actually solve societal problems. And that the church is supposed to be a microcosm of what happens when heaven touches earth. The ancient Celts called them colonies of heaven. That every church should be a colony of heaven. Every church in this city that calls upon the name of Jesus should be a taste of heaven. That when you walk in there, you feel something of heaven. You feel something of Jesus in your life. And that testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It opens up a future. It opens up understanding. You become like a son of Issachar and you understand the time and you know what to do. So how do I do that? I'm not a, a politician. You don't have to be a politician. Some of the greatest influencers in the world right now are not politicians. Some of the ones throughout history. I mean, God's used politicians throughout history. And he used kings and presidents and prime ministers and everything else. But it's generally somebody emerges with a voice. Somebody who's attached to a group of somebodies. <laughs> and they are together. And something is revealed. And they speak out. And it becomes something that changes culture. It changes society. We've seen that all throughout our history. And here we are right now in this point in history. Who are the people that are going to speak out? I tell you, you got to speak out. You got to hear and then you got to speak. I love what it says about Peter in the book of Acts. I quote it all the time. Peter, who had just 40 days, 50 days before that, denied Jesus three times 
after he prophesied, Jesus prophesied that he would deny him three times. Like that's, that's pretty embarrassing. Jesus says, you're going you're gonna to reject me three times. No, 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 no way. Yes, you will. No way. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. What happens? Oh, right in the, in the ear sight of Jesus. <laughs> Boom, he denies him three times. Vehemently. Like it had power behind it. No, I'm not with him. I mean, he almost cursed the very thought of it, you know. And yet Jesus, in his tender mercies, comes in there and speaks to him and restores him. We're in a time right now where we're being tested in our very spirit. The innards of our soul is being disturbed right now. You don't understand it. I'm hearing so much of this right now, and I'm feeling a lot of this. This is a time right now not to run and hide, not to get behind the wall of beans in your basement, but seriously, it's a time right now to focus upon Jesus Christ, learn to behold him and be transfigured in his presence. So last week I talked about how the church is a laboratory, it's a tension of heaven, is that it be a laboratory of love. That if we can't love one another in here, how will you love your neighbor who you do not know? And so as brothers and sisters, and I, I, you know, we're part of a church culture right now, I'm talking about America, where people get so easily offended. Uh, have you noticed that? <laughs> Everyone's offended by everything. What I'm wearing, it offends me. Well, you feel like saying, well, what you wear offends me. But you don't do that because the Bible says to love your enemies. And those who speak, do not speak well of you, bless them. And so that is not easy. That's a different kingdom than what we live in. And so sometimes you have to speak those things in faith. As it says in Romans, speaking those things which are not as though they were. I love you so much. That's an R not as were. You look awesome today. R not as were. I appreciate the input. R not as were. So we're learning a new culture. That culture somehow, somewhere reaches a tipping point in a church, and the light of Jesus Christ begins to shine out of that church. Man, I am so committed to this. Start with me first, you know, that's the biggest challenge. But I'm committed to this, that something is going to happen in this Brunswick campus. Do you see how we're growing? We're growing out here, numbers, more people coming. We're coming in. I want you to know right now, if you're new, you're coming in. I think you're in the right place. I think God led you here. I hope you can become a part. I hope you can get at the wall with us with a sword in one hand and a spade in the other, you know, you're building and fixing, but you're also protecting like Nehemiah did. I pray that you have a vision for this nation to be turned around. I pray that you have a vision for revival. That's where we are. That's who we are. That's what we want to do. But we also are not stupid. We understand there's a day-to-day -day tactical way that we live. And we are learning the methods of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, call unto me. And Jesus said, learn of me. And right now, we're in a learn of me period. We are learning Jesus Christ. Every time I feel like I want to respond with a bad attitude or a bad heart, I feel the, t the tension of my commitment to who Jesus is. And it's like, Jesus is this way, and where you're heading is that way. I know, but just once. Can I just say this once? Can I... Can I reply on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just this once? Can I set up a separate page where no one knows who I am? <laughs> Joe Schmo? Then I can go and say whatever I want. But you just feel the Holy Spirit pointing this way. Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to get the quickest result that I can get over here. Jesus. Jeez, I won't feel as good as I think I'm going to feel if I say this. In fact, we can always find a scripture for it. I'm going to speak the truth in love. You're already, you're disqualified. There's no love in that truth. <laughs> so give your truth over to the Lord. And call out to the Lord that he will bless that person. Well, I don't want them blessed. They need to understand that God is a holy God also. And he's a God of judgment. There's the judgment seat of Christ. 
I mean, you come up with all these things that are a mishmash of your own little theology about who God is. We continually to create God in our image rather than being the image that he's creating us into, which is him. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't in my notes. Okay, good. Let's go back here. I, I get off track here when I, let's see what I was going to say. Yeah, that laboratory of love. We're learning to love one another. So... <laughs> It's funny, when I first wrote this down the other day, I thought, it took me back to grade two. In grade two, I was moving from Lakewood to Brooklyn school system. I, what, what was I, seven years old, I think? Six or seven years old, something like that. I'd been a, used to Lakewood schools, I'd get into Brooklyn schools, and they used a word I wasn't familiar with. And so all of a sudden, the teacher, like at the beginning of the day, said, who would like to go, who needs to go to the lavatory? Honestly, I wasn't paying attention. I thought she said laboratory. I thought, I like chemistry. I raised my hand, you know, only one. So I go out there and they lead me to this room that was not <laughs> laboratory. And I thought, sometimes it happens in the kingdom of God. You know, we misunderstand what the Lord said. But let me just say, there's a laboratory of love, which means every one of us is, is intentionally by heaven rubbing on one another. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I think I could stretch that verse without denying its context and saying it's men and women. So we, we rub one another. You've got to be close to rub. And we get together and, you know, we're, we're on a team that's, that's, that's greeting at the door. And I greet one way and they greet another. It's like, oh, it kind of aggravates me the way they do that, you know. That's why you're there. To be aggravated because the aggravation creates a response and it's like the Lord putting a little trowel in your heart you know and he's he's digging something up you know he's let's get rid of that. that's a bad seed there let's get rid of that you go I never prayed for that you go, oh yeah you, you prayed that hundreds of times you said things like Lord shake me mold me make me into whatever we sang songs shake me mold me make me whatever you prayed Lord Jesus you prayed in tongues or Rabba Shabba you didn't know you were praying Lord dig deeper into my heart, conform me into the very image of Jesus Christ, bring love up in my heart. That's a laboratory of love. We're learning how to love. But don't just, we're in this culture right now that says, I like it, I'm gone. I don't like gray carpet, you should have red carpet. I'm out of here. Church down the street has red carpet. You say people don't think that way. They do. They do. And I watch all the time, schism, schism. You know what? I, I, people ask me sometimes, they go, what church would you go to in the city, you know, if you weren't the pastor here? Well, of course, you know, I'd go here. But if this didn't exist, you know, I'd, I'd look around for a church that had love. We're, we're, and I'm not saying perfect, perfected. You, you probably won't find that. And if you join it, it'll be messed up. But anyway, we, we look around for a laboratory of love. Where are people, honestly, they're real. They're not just kind of saying weird things, but they're wanting to connect together because we want to fulfill the prayer of Jesus in John 17 that we might be one as the Father and Son are one. I think that's Jesus' dream. And we want to, so we have this laboratory here of love. The, and, the, and the church is meant to have influence out of this laboratory. It's not just an outreach. It's you are the outreach. When you go to your job tomorrow, whenever you go, we're, we're not with you, but we kind of are. You know, we're praying. We're praying that there'll be impact, power. You know, I've told people this for years. I used to be a business trainer, uh, and I, I told people all the time, look, because they said, you know, I, I'm in a job. It's a dead-end job, and, you know, I'm not happy with it. They're not paying me enough. I mean, all these reasons why. And I said, here, do this. Can you quit the job? And they're like, no, 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 I can't quit the job. I got bills I got to pay. I said, okay, okay, let's change the atmosphere then. Here's what you need to do. Just start praying that God will give you innovation. Solve problems. Well, I don't want to solve a problem. I want a different job. Let's solve a problem. Joseph did it when he was in Potiphar's house, when he was in prison. He went there and, and realized his environment and emerged to the top of that environment. And then he get falsely accused. He ended up in a different environment. But he started carrying along this thing wherever we go, we emerge. I've told this, said this for years. I love that about the Jews you can drop 10 Jews into any city and they bring transformation. 
It's in their DNA. It's in their understanding that we are here and we're creating a culture that is enviable, prosperous, solid, strong. And I know Jews aren't perfect. I'm just telling you, there is something upon Jews historically that wherever they go, they influence and they emerge. And that is in our roots. You are a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, who is a Jew, you are following him, and you are dropped into a place, and you're meant to produce problem-solving in that situation. Solve problems, innovate. Solve problems, innovate. If you do that, you will prosper, and you will be advanced in that organization. So you're taking the laboratory of what you learn here, and you're taking it out there. Here's a verse I want to read. If you could turn to Proverbs 18 in my nine minutes left. Proverbs 18, verse 16. Proverbs 18, verse 16, a verse that we probably all know. I love it. It says this, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great kings or great men. Now, this is speaking of, it could be speaking of a lot of different things. It could be speaking of what I call your personal currencies. Your personal, I come up with, I don't know, about I think 15 or 19, I forget what it is. I'm, I'm getting more all the time. Personal currencies. Your history, your personal history is a currency. That, that can be something that is used in your life to move you forward, open doors, advance, whatever. Even your difficult history. The fact that you were on drugs. Well, that history can be used as street cred to talk to people that are struggling with drugs. So it becomes a currency. The skills you have are a currency. The money you have is a currency. And what this is saying in the Bible is, is that gift that God has given you, what has been given to you personally, it can make room before you and bring you before kings. I remember when I first went to Canada in 86, I was trying to kind of break through to the community. There was only about 100 and probably 20,000 people that lived in the city. We were going to be planting a church and... Um, you know, first thing you do in a city that size, you try to get connected. And there was a lot of doors that were closed. It was difficult to, uh, to get connected. And I was a young man. I was 29 years old, trying to figure this out, foreign country. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just trying to connect with people. I'm an outsider, though, from America. You're not from the Maritimes. You know, all that stuff that happens when a stranger goes to a place that he's not born or raised in. And so what happened was, I, uh, in starting the church, I... I, I, has, I had a few skills in developing logo uh, uh, brochures, things like that. I don't remember how I even did it now because we didn't really have computers, you know, pull that stuff together. But I just had ideas and thoughts, pulled it together. And somehow I got notice. And what I told, I've told this story, this part of the story before, but a lady who passed away, uh, right the week that I got there, and I happened to pray for her, she left $100,000 to the United Church of Canada to use for healing ministries. And I remember when it happened, I thought, shoot, that would be amazing to have $100,000 devoted to healing ministries. Because at that time, it'd be John Wimber and many others we'd love to bring into our small city in Eastern Canada. But you know, how do you get access to that? Well, anyway, what happened was it came to the group of people that were running it, the team from the United Church of Canada, that I had skills in in crafting brochures and things like that. And they were going to do some small conferences. And I, so they invited me over and said, can you bring your stuff? I showed them my stuff. And they said, well, you want to be a part of the team? I said, sure. I mean, it was, it was a small gift. I don't even use it anymore, but it was a small gift that opened the right door and brought me before people. So I now I'm all of a sudden in the team of people that have to spend, now this is 1986, have to spend $100,000 within seven years toward healing ministries. It feels like it'd be easy, man. It was a challenge. And so I just started dreaming as I got influence within the team and eventually they allowed me to kind of lead the team and eventually actually they stopped doing it and gave me the whole mailing list from what we had developed. We were doing conferences with 16 to 1,700 people coming in a city of 100,000. We were bringing people from all over the world to speak. I mean, John Paul Jackson, Mike Bickle, all these people. Everything. It was like my dream list. We're cranking through this, trying to spend this $100,000. We never did spend the $100,000, and it was given to something else. I don't know what, because we were making money as we were doing it. 
And yet getting thousands of people from all over Maine and New England and the Maritimes to this day, it has seeded something into that region because of one woman who gave $100,000. Her gift made room for her even after she passed away. So you begin to find as a person, what's my currency? I've got a book on it, if you want to read it. Your prophetic life map, it talks about it. But how would I find out? What, what is my story? Everyone in this room has something that you give. And when you sow that, rather than holding your cards close to your chest and saying, I just, want to, I just want to hold some cards. I really don't want to play the game. But instead of that, you yield your gifts into the purposes of God, into a local ecclesia. I'm not just talking about money, although money's important in that. I'm talking about who you are as a person. I mean, if you've got a gift of singing, worshiping, whatever it might be, you know, you try out. If you want to be in a drama, you get involved in one of our Christmas or, or Easter plays. If you're a creative person, you get in the creative community. Well, I don't know anyone here. That's how you get to know people. And when it happens, you start to be knit together in a laboratory of love is being found in a very powerful way. And it says in the Bible, it will grow up into a holy temple unto the Lord. But you've got to yield yourself. Even if you're only temporary here and you're, I'm moving to Montana next April. Okay, well, why are you here? Yield yourself. You know, become a volunteer or something. Explore something. You say, I don't know what my gifts is. Well, then start off as a, as a greeter or an usher or something like that. We need help with our grounds out here and up in Middleburg, down in Akron. You know, we need gardeners. We need people that understand trees, plants, and geese. We need a word from the Lord and how to get rid of our geese, you know. So I'm reading that and I'm thinking, I love the gift. You give, you, a man's gift makes room for him. It, it has all through my life when I yielded my gift. When people didn't know who I was or what I had, I didn't typically advance very far. I didn't get any open doors. How many of you are waiting for an open door in your life? Raise your hand. Well, that's not too many. I thought it'd be more. Let me ask that again because you had to think about it. How many, I'll rephrase it. How many of you are looking for like a gate of opportunity to open up in your life right now? Oh, okay. Well, good. We're in the right place today. How are gates open? It starts with giving. When you yield who you are in all your personal currencies. If you've got little kids that you raised up, you can actually help some people that have little kids. Either tell them what, what you found out that worked or what didn't work. I mean, I get around young couples with children. I'm like, oh, I remember that, you know. I remember with my grandkids living with me right now because they're between houses. I'm learning a lot. I'm remembering a lot. And remembering why. Kids are typically given to young people. <laughs> I love my grandkids. In fact, they're, they're, they're doing great. You know, it's been, I don't know, two or three weeks now they've been with us and you know, we're just adjusting our life and getting out of our grumpiness and, uh, and, and moving into a, uh, a new way of living. I love it. So what it is, when you yield yourself, when you step into a role, sometimes we're thrust into something, you get into something, open up and release who you are. And when you do, it's the cement, it's the glue, it's the grout, it's the love, it's sacrificial, it's what Jesus did. He didn't come to be served, he came to serve. We didn't come to be served, we come to serve. And as you yield your life, for God so loved the world that he gave. What did he do? He gave his only begotten son when Jesus came as a gift. He opened up gates. You know what gates he wants to open up? Hell. The church was called. The church was a gift to the world. And the church, the gates of hell, will not prevail against them. When you yield, when this church comes into its, which I believe is we're in a pivotal moment between now and the end of the year where we're going to shift and it may not, I mean, maybe some tactical things might be strategic, but you're going to feel it. There's going to be a shift because God is about, we, <laughs> the Lord's been telling me 10X over this church, 10X, which would be, I don't know, five, 6,000 people, something like that. Why are people important? Because they're people. But God's going to blow this thing up and we need to know how to build strong, creative communities, how to build strong, serving communities, strong worship communities, strong 
make sure the properties look good communities, strong ladies groups, men's groups, youth groups. You know, we want to move into a different place, but we all yield ourselves. Why? Because a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before kings. One last thing with my 30 seconds left. Barnabas was an amazing volunteer. <laughs> he apparently had a little bit of money. And in the early church, in fact, I think it's, uh, let's see if I can find the first one, in Acts chapter 4, it says this. Now think of this. Man's gift makes room for him. Man's gift makes room for him. In Acts 4, his name is Joseph, actually. It's not Barnabas. Barnabas was a nickname given to him by the disciples. His mom gave him the name. His mom and dad gave him the name Joseph, which, which means a, oh, what does it mean? I had it right here. Ah, here it is. May God multiply. That's his original name. But the disciples called him Barnabas, son of encouragement. Why? Because he gave. He yielded who he was. One of the things he had, in fact, you know what? His finances yielded for him an ultimate apostolic anointing. It was probably on him the whole time. He just didn't know it. So he, come, he sells some property he has. He gives it to the apostles because the church has momentum. It's taking off. Of course, it needs money. He does that and something changes in who he is. He's not just a volunteer. God begins to use him in a very powerful way. So he starts as a giver, but then he becomes a promoter. He finds out that there's this young guy named Saul who the apostles had trouble with because Saul was a murderer of Christians. But he came to know Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9, I think it is. Acts 9. And so when he comes near the disciples, everyone hides. It's like, I don't know, is, this just, is he faking it? Like, is he really a follower of Jesus Christ? You're gonna, we, need, we need some time. This guy needs to really settle down. Barnabas gets a hold of him because the, the, the apostles like Barnabas, because Barnabas was a giver and supported the whole thing. He brings Saul to them, introduces them to them, and they embrace Saul as a friend. You say, how, how, how does that work? That's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. He's opened up. So Barnabas is being faithful as the Lord is moving deeper and deeper and deeper into being a strategic planner for the emerging church in the first century. After a promoter, he becomes apostle. They decide to start a church in Antioch. They send Barnabas over there. There's five people listed, five guys listed that were the leaders of that church. And as it is in Jewish custom, the first person, primo, primary individual, is always listed first. Barnabas is listed first. Saul is listed last. So Saul's emerged in a leadership. In fact, he was not there initially, but Barnabas went over to where he was and said, Saul, come on, man, you need to come over to Antioch and help me. He's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what his response was, but maybe it was hesitant because he had not been received well by the church. But he says, come on, come over there. I believe you've got potential, man. You're going to do, you know, you imagine Barnabas, he has no idea that Paul's going to write one third of the New Testament. And so he gets him and he pulls him over. He gets him into leadership, even though he's relatively new to the kingdom of God. Gets him into leadership, but he's the number five guy rather than number one. Barnabas is number one. And they work together and the church grows and amazing things happen. And then they decide, you know, let's set apart for us Paul and Bar Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Saul, actually. Let's set them apart and send them. And so they send them out. And they're supposed to spend time, you know, ministering and blessing and going to different churches and all that. And so Saul goes with Barnabas. Barnabas is the leader of the team. Saul's with him. I don't know if there was an age difference. There probably was. Could be 10, 15, 20 year difference between them. Uh, Barnabas being the older person. But all of, that's, in, that's in Acts 13. And all of a sudden at the end of Acts 13, the narrative shifts and it's no longer Barnabas and Saul. It's Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas goes with it. Like he's not like, hey, I'm from Cleveland. We believe in seniority. I was in a union for 20 years. And you're going to have to wait your time, Paul. I get that God's moving you in very powerful ways, but you're still young. No, something happened to the grace of God emerged. Barnabas has the heart to be able to yield that. Why? Because he never, he never thought he was going to get in this deep. He's just a giver. He's a supporter. But when you do that, boom, 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 
boom, doors open, doors open, doors open, doors open. You go deeper into the places of God. Who knows what God might do with you? I've got friends. I wish I could tell some of the stories, but trust me, I've got many friends. I've seen them go through these doors, boom, 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 into the depths of being used and having influence over nations and over cities when that was never a part of what they ever thought they might do, but because they yielded their gift, the doors begin to open. Let's all stand together if we could. This day is brought to you by a bunch of volunteers. <laughs> yeah, we just thank them all. Some of them miss the service because they're out there setting up. So here's what I want you to do. Let's honor those volunteers whether you eat pizza or not. Some of you go, well, I don't like pizza. It's not about the pizza. Yeah, that's right. If you want to bring your own lunch, you can do that. But we, we got some pizza out there and we got some other things. I don't know what else is out there. We've got stuff for the kids. And we're so happy you're here today. Hang out with us. Give us a little bit of time. We've got some stuff outside. Kids can play. Adults can, have, there's, there's cornhole. There's places to just sit around, chat, talk, eat together, meet somebody. I really encourage you. If God's brought you to this place, and he has, let's take the next step. Yield. Yield yourself and your time for another hour or so. Say, yeah, I'll do it. I got to eat it anyway. I think I'll stick around. God, you, meet, you can meet one person in this room that changes your life. One person. I mean, with me, I met a guy in 94, asked me to have a Coke, shared this two weeks ago. That Coke totally changed my life because of the man that gave me the Coke. He bought it, actually. Sat there drinking that Coke, realized that I was before greatness, and the Lord opened the door, and the trajectory of my life shifted with a man I did not know by one Coke. I have stories of people making one connection that brought them, this isn't about finances, but this example is financial, millions of dollars, one shift. I got a guy in our church right now praying for a relationship like that, and if that relationship comes through, it means millions of dollars to him. So there's the financial aspect, but there's also the depths of spiritual understanding that can come. You meet one person, it could be a lifetime friend. Our little granddaughter Josie went to school this week, Christian school, met a little girl, came to me, said this to her mom too, but she came to me, she says, I have a new friend that's going to be my friend forever. She's in grade one, first grade. I said, really? I said, what's her name? She said, I don't know. <laughs> so obviously there's a little more that needs to happen in that relationship but the connection's there and I just laughed I thought well may, may it be so I, I still have friends here from third grade you know so, so uh, may it be so so we're going to bless you in that and we're going to release you in a minute and is someone going to come up and help guide us in this is that what we do and how we do it and how you eat pizza and things like that but first of all just real quick let me just look over the crowd let's wait on the Lord for a minute if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, maybe you're just invited by somebody to come. I don't know what your reason is, but you're here. You may even wonder, what was all that stuff? What was that 45 minutes of singing all about? Well, it's an engagement with God. You may not understand it right now, but these people are doing it. I mean, they're coming out on a Sunday morning worshiping corporately because there's something about when you yield yourself in worship, doors open in your life. Doors into heavenly understanding, doors into your own personality, doors into your own foibles, your own idiosyncrasies. I've had the Lord's finger touch me in so many ways during worship where I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. Give me the energy of the Holy Spirit to change me, to shape Steve Witt in who he needs to be. I mean, it's just amazing what happens in the presence of God. But in order to truly understand that, you, you must be born again, like Billy Graham said. And like I said in John 3, you must be born again. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You may believe in Jesus as a historic figure, but until you say, I believe he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life, you cannot enter into the purposes of God. You step out of yourself, you step into him and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want you. Shape, change, mold my life in Jesus' name. And he will do that day one. So right now, if you're here and you say, I've never done that, or I did that at one time and I drifted off. I got baptized when I was eight, but you know, I haven't really had much to do with it since then. 
wherever you are right now, but you know that you're not near the Lord, you, you do not feel the active voice of God in your life, we can change that right now. If you will yield yourself, like I've been saying, give yourself. For God so loved the world, he gave. The only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. See, the door opens when you move in and give yourself fully to Jesus Christ. So if you're here right now, as I just look across this room, you say, that's me, Steve. I've, I've been away from the Lord. I've never even done this. If that's you, and we're not going to embarrass you in any way, we're bringing some, we've got team members up here now. We're ready to pray for you after the service, after we dismiss, and then we can have pizza together. But if you're here right now and you've never done that, just raise your hand. This is a signia to me. Yes, I see right there. Anyone? Thank you, sir. Anyone else around this room, just raise your hand. You say, that's me. That's me. I need prayer. Would you pray with me? Just raise your hand around the room. I'll just wait about 15 more seconds. I don't want to miss you. The pizza tastes much better when you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's true. It's been proven. That if your heart is a heart of love, everything tastes better and every drink tastes better. It does something with the endorphins in your body. It really does. Christ in you. So we bless that right now. Anyone else, real quick, before I close, across this room. I don't want to miss anybody. Just ra raise your hand, wave it to me. All right. All right, you can put your hand down, sir. Let's just pray this together. We're going to pray it with him right now. Lord Jesus, I come before you. Forgive me of my sin. I've messed up sometimes. But Lord, I give myself to you. Jesus, shape me through the power of your shed blood. Wash me, cleanse me, restore me. And show me your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you prayed it in faith, sir, it means that you're born again according to the word of God. And we thank the Lord for that. And right when we dismiss in just about two minutes, and, and Jay's going to give us some expl explanation of what we're doing here. Really, we encourage all of you to stay. There'll be enough room in here that if you want to stay cool and not be going out there, you can do that too. Uh, and if any of you need ministry, this one guy who gave his heart to the Lord, if he comes up, we've got a book we want to give you, sir. We just want to pray over you, get you on your way. The rest of you, anyone who has financial, physical needs, whatever it might be, feel free to come up. Our team will pray for you. They'll stick around here for a while. We'll save them some pizza too. And our Middleburg campus will be joining us in about 45 minutes. So welcome. We're glad you're here. God bless you. Jake. Hey, just a couple quick instructions for you. So when you go out these double doors, we have pizza at the cafe for you. The drinks are by the men's bathroom.